Um, hello and welcome everyone to the Friday Tech Talk at the Tech Academy. This week we are joined by Tech Academy graduate Scott Katzelnick, who works as a software developer at Braille Skateboarding. Um, and Braille Skateboarding is a media company with over 5 million followers on YouTube. Um, the founder wants to make skateboarding the biggest sport in the world. Um, and Scott's going to be discussing um, what he learned in his process from boot camp to uh, software developer and how to stand out uh, in that process of getting a job. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us and I will let Scott take it away. Thanks so much for being here, Scott. Thank you, Kenzie. Thank you, Rick. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Scott Kitselnik. I live in uh, central New Jersey uh, off, out on the East Coast and I am currently the lead developer for Braille Skateboarding, as Kenzie said. Um, What's funny is a year ago, um, I didn't have a job. I was an Uber driver. Uh, I was in between jobs. I had been going to school for chemistry and um, I thought I wanted to become a doctor. And I was about five years into that schooling route. And uh, I had just left my job. It was a pretty, pretty cushy job as a, as a manager at a local, uh, a local food market. And it was in charge of inventory. I was an inventory control manager and it paid the bills and it did what it had to do and it allowed me to go to school. But there was always this inkling, this feeling that, you know, I wasn't happy and people I around that I was around weren't happy. And I knew um, at the time I was 32, I wouldn't leave if I hadn't at that point in time. So took a leap of faith uh, and I left my job. I started doing Uber and I started to do some research and some soul searching to figure out if what I was doing, what I was going to school for was realistic, if it's really what I wanted and you know what the rest of my career and life was going to look like. Just some uh, backstory leading up to that point. So I've always been you know, super analytical, super um, uh, into wanting to know the root cause of things. When I was a child, I used to, take things apart. I used to get gifts and connect sets and rector sets and all these things that I would instantly take apart. And of course, I could never figure out how to put it back together. But it was that drive to want to learn how to put it back together. It was that wanting to know how things actually work down to, you know, the most detailed, minute levels to have a true understanding. And that's kind of been my motivation throughout my life. It continues to be to this day, whether I'm learning something new or uh, something from my past. I always go a little bit above and beyond when it comes to research and looking into things and, and, and knowing how things connect and make, make the world tick. Um, so my love for computers started back in 1998. My father bought, he splurged and bought a gateway machine. So this was like a huge deal. And it was a very fast computer. It had, I believe, 1.2 gigahertz single core processor with 256 megabytes of RAM. And I think it had a two gigabyte hard drive, if I remember. Um, and that was a ton. It came with a manual about this thick. And I remember reading maybe half of it over the course of the lifetime of the computer. Um, but it shaped, it kind of chiseled out uh, a huge part of me that um, found this love for computers. So any nothing up to that point. I had played sports. I had played um, Little League and football my whole life. I played football in high school. And I do love sports. I'm a huge Giants fan. Go New York Giants. And, um, and I love sports, but I'm, I wasn't an athlete. I wasn't a professional athlete. And, you know, I could tell from a very young age. So I knew that I couldn't do – sports professionally even though I had loved it and I knew I loved science and I figured you know what I love science just as much as I love football I'm going to do something relating to science for my career so uh, coming out of high school I gotten into Northeastern University and I, I started studying chemistry I made the decision to become a doctor um, and it was a very strange decision I became I came to the decision to become a doctor, not because of pressure from my family, not because of um, anything ex 
you know, extrinsic. It was all internal. It was what I thought the right thing to do was. Um, for me at the time, I thought it would be a challenge. I thought it would su- help me support my family. I thought it would be something that I could wake up every day and or go to sleep at night and feel good about what I was doing. And I just thought it was the right thing to do. But I never loved medicine. I never loved chemistry, the way I love sports, the way I love the computer and technology. And I think that is ultimately what led me up to making my decision to leave the supermarket chain and to figure out what I really wanted to do in life. Um, So I started doing some research and because of the pandemic, um, I was able to have, I was able to have the freedom to do things from home, right? We all have had to make use of our time with the pandemic. We all have had to, um, get the most out of it that we can, right? So, and this was kind of before it really had hit America. This is October 2019. And the the pandemic really didn't hit here until February, March, but it was something that was around and, and, and there was a lot of talk about it. So I started to take that into account. I started to take my my concern that I was going down a path that I didn't love. And there are these paths that I do love, which I have options to go down, such as technology. And when I looked at technology, there's a bunch of different fields. You know, I could become an IT specialist or an admin. or um, You know, I could open up a hardware repair store like Louis, Louis Rossman in New York City or something. There's lots of different paths I could have gone down. But I said to myself the same thing I said when I was young and deciding what I should do with my life. And I said, what is going to give me the most satisfaction? What will I wake up every day and go to sleep every night knowing that I'm doing something that I'm proud of, that I think is making a difference in the world that I can support my family with and that I love. And one of the things that was so awe-inspiring to me was software. Software was like this magical thing that someone else did and I never knew how it worked. I wouldn't even know where to begin. And, you know, unless you read an article, a medium article or something on what is even HTML or CSS, the web is magical. You know, it just it seems like this very complicated thing that you wouldn't that you wouldn't be able to intrinsically or, you know, um, you wouldn't be able to figure out on your own. And I knew that because it wasn't this this easy thing that it would be a challenge and I wanted to see how far it would go. So I actually started to self-study. Um, I purchased countless courses on Udemy. Um, did a little bit of Skillshare. I signed up for a plural site website, um, and I did all these things to begin with to give myself an introduction to even see if this is something that I wanted to do. And I instantly fell in love, and I knew it's something I did want to do the rest of my life. Um, I knew I couldn't do it though because I had had an issue. My issue was I was going to school for chemistry for five years and I didn't even have my bachelor's degree yet. So I was in kind of a tough spot, right? I knew I just couldn't apply to jobs with just my high school diploma or any background whatsoever uh, in software development. So I did a Google search. It was a really slow night on Google and I was sitting parked in the car and I did a, I remember specifically, I did a Google search and I said, best coding bootcamp for remote learners. And in those top five was the tech Academy. This was, uh, this was maybe end of December, end of 2019, January, 2020. And, uh, I went to those sites and I looked at all of the reports, the, I looked at those reports. I don't know how many people are aware, and I forget the name of the reports. I'm not sure, Kenzie or Rick, if you know the name, but they tell you the maturation rate. It shows you the average salary for graduates, the percent of graduates, and all these schoolers are bound to have to make these reports public. And I looked at all of the the CIR reports. Thank you. I looked at all of these reports for all the schools, and the Tech Academy just immediately stuck out to me. It was just they are doing something right that no one else was. Um, and I wanted to be part of it. Also, not to mention that uh, Rick, our founder, is very good at being on video. 
you know, his videos are the best. He really helps. He really helped me understand key concepts in school. And he really did sell it to me when I watched those intro videos. He's, he's very good on video. And there was just this feeling that it was more than just a boot camp. You're in, you're out. Good luck. It was more of a promise that they were making that we're going to give you the tools necessary to be a software developer, a UI, UX designer, a systems admin, whatever you wanted to be, and that you were going to be able to, to thrive as long as you put in the hard work. That's something I did have. I didn't have my degree. I didn't have years of experience. I didn't have a mentor. I had no connections in the field. I literally had nothing. But I had my work ethic, and I knew that if I could push past other people, I at least had a shot. So I went for it. I, I did. I went for it, and I worked a lot of hours every day. I probably worked an average of 16 hours a day for the course of the boot camp. I was able to extend my boot camp about an extra month to work on live project and job placement stuff a little bit longer. Um and that was actually all on the shoulders of, of Rick and Forrest working with me and making sure that I got everything done that I needed to do. The school is also incredibly generous and they want you to succeed. They don't succeed if we don't succeed. So um, I ended up finishing the boot camp October. It was funny. I finished the boot camp October 9th was my graduation date and I had left the supermarket chain October 11th of the previous year. So it was actually almost an exact year later that I had my certification as a full stack software developer. And I started the hardest part of this entire journey. I mean, learning coding is hard, right? Learning how to write, you know, syn syntactically sugarful code is very hard. You need experience, you need time. It would, it's great if you have a mentor. Um, some of these concepts are mind bending and you need to see them a million times before you truly understand them. But the hardest part is the job placement. It's just, it just intrinsically is because what's happening is you're losing control of the situation, right? You can only control what you can control. And there's now all of a sudden this other party, this employer, this interview that you don't have full grasp of full control of. You might, not know what to expect when you go into it. You might not um, get callbacks. You're gonna get a lot of no call, no shows. And and it's also mentally difficult. Uh, Rick, Rick says it, Forrest, who was my job placement director when I, when I went, said that you are going to get put down. You, you really are. And you know, there's a lot of people out there that aren't the nicest and there are a lot of nice people as well. And there's just a mix of everything. You have to be prepared for anything. Um, you have to also treat it like a job. It's incredibly important that you work at least 40 hours a week. I ended up working just as much on the job placement as I did to learn software development. Now, I love software development. I love learning new technologies and applying them and seeing something work. I absolutely hate looking for jobs. I just, I absolutely hate it. Now, don't get me wrong. There are are some really good things about it. Like you might get a call back and that's exciting, or you might, um, you know, finally be able to fit your entire, your entire resume on one page. And that's finally, I was able to do that. And there's these, there's these wins that you can, that you can get past doing the job placement, job placement time. But you need to, um, you need to make sure that you're using that work ethic and you're using that know how to work harder than the next person because I knew that if I went to bed when I wanted to go to bed, if I watched YouTube videos when I wanted to watch YouTube videos, there was someone else, maybe down the street, maybe across the across the across the country or on the other side of the world, that was deciding not to watch that YouTube video or go to bed. They were deciding to continue to work and and they were going to benefit better than I was. So I went through the job, uh, job hunt for about two months, and I had gotten a call from Forrest, a tip that there was this job, and they were looking for a freelancer for maybe a month. They were having an issue. They have an app. At the time, the school didn't have a React program. They wanted to know if I was familiar with React. 
I was thankfully I had done some on my of myself learning on React, and they were getting rejected from the App Store. Now I had released an app back before I even went to the boot camp, and so I was familiar with Apple's guidelines. And they're very strict, um, especially compared to Google's. So uh, I interviewed with them, and uh, they liked what I had to say in my resume and their recommendation that they had gotten from the school. And they gave me a, about a two week trial, right? So from mid December till the beginning of January, I was to get the app approved on the app store and to begin working on the website. And it all had to be connected with a, with a backend. And this is using, this is react, right? JavaScript. It's a JavaScript framework. And we decided to use Node as our backend technology. Uh, however, the developer, the freelance developer that built this, wasn't using a REST API to have the backend talk to the client. He was using something called GraphQL. Now, GraphQL has really picked up in the last year. But before the last year, you would be very hard to find someone using or mentioning GraphQL. I, needless to say, I had no clue what it was. Uh, now that I use it, I love it. Now that I see how it works, it's amazing. And, you know, I prefer to use it over HTTP and, and REST. But I, um, I had no clue how to, how to make it work. So I worked with the freelancers, and we got the app approved on the App Store, and the website started. And because I was able to deliver on those things, I was, I was able to, to cement my job with Braille. And ever since then, it's it's been a roller coaster ride of up and downs. And uh, since they were using freelance developers, um, and then I I became their first official developer, they uh, they ended up dropping the freelance developer. So now I'm kind of doing the work for three people, and it's a lot. It's a lot, but you know especially with software development, the best way to learn is by, you know, building a project and actually getting your hands on the keyboard and building out, you know, building out these things. And uh, you could, you can get stuck in tutorial hell and you could, you know, you can review materials over and over, but if you're really going to understand something and have that aha moment, you, uh, you really are going to, you really are going to need to get your hands on that keyboard. So, so that's where I currently am. That's kind of a, uh, a 15 minute history of where I came from and kind of how I went through, how I went through the, um, how I went through the actual process of actually getting hired at Braille. As far as Braille goes, we use a lot of technology. So I mentioned React. We use GraphQL as our, interface between our server and our client. Um, I personally like to use Visual Studio Code as my IDE with a bunch of really cool um, with a bunch of really cool extensions that make my workflow a lot easier, right? There is a GraphQL and a React plugin. Um, because of all the different versions of JavaScript, you have to use something called Babel. And uh, what Babel does is it kind of helps you translate your maybe uh, destructured object to an older version of JavaScript. So people are using and going to your website or using your app on devices as new as, you know, the iPhone 12 Pro Max all the way back to maybe, a, you know, a Google Pixel 1 or something like that. So your code that you write once needs to be able to be translated amongst all of those, all of those different all of those different devices. And there's a technology called Babel, which is built into React. So there was learning about GraphQL, there was learning about Babel. Um, and uh, we also use React Native to run our app. So because I had familiarity with React, I was able to pick up React Native very quickly. Uh, also, I was able to get a little bit of mentorship from that freelance developer before he had left the team. But uh, it, it's been a whirlwind. We just updated the app. We actually released the Braille skateboarding app on the App Store officially November 11th before I began at the company. But we got it to its first working state around December 20th. And ever since then, we've released, we have released 13 updates to the App Store. So we've added things like the ability to post Instagram and TikTok 
a lot of people love social features. We're not trying to rebuild a social app, you know, a uh, social platform, but we are trying to build in social features for skateboarders around the world. Aaron Cairo, who's the owner of Braille Skateboarding, has a really, a really clear message. He wants to make skateboarding the most popular sport in the world. When I first heard it, I said, that's crazy. Football or baseball or soccer or, you know, American football, those are always going to be the most popular sports. So what does he, what does he mean by that? Well, they're going to be the most popular sports as far as television is concerned. But as far as how many people are actually involved in the sport itself, that's where his goal lives. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody has played a sport before. I'm sure a lot of people have. And we were talking about this before the stream. A sport is about having fun and, you know, being on a team and, and really, um, you know, it's about winning and losing and all of these things that games are meant to be. But there's so much more that goes into a sport, especially a team sport. These are these huge life lessons that you learn, you know, respect, time management, teamwork, um, you know, uh, respecting your peers and communication skills and critical thinking. There's a lot that goes into it that you need to you need to learn in order to be successful on a team. And that could be a football team, that could be a skateboarding crew, it could be it could be a software development team. It it really does not matter how you're what environment you're in, these these values and morals and lessons will carry throughout your entire life. I played football in high school. Um and I really never did skateboard, but I started to because I want to be part of that team, right? There's this urge for us to be part of that team. So at Braille, everyone skateboards. So I'm starting to learn how to skateboard. And it really is like being on a team again. And all of these great lessons and, and morals are, are coming back up. Uh, I would highly suggest that uh, everybody try their best to join a team of some sort whether that's a meetup group or uh, e even if it's virtual uh, or a cooking group or some, you know, talking about software in general or a book club or, or something that brings you into contact with other people. That was one of the things I wish I had done differently that I thought would have expedited it and made my journey a lot easier. So often do you hear about people that get job offers because they were able to put themselves in a position where, they knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody. And it really is true. I mean, I applied to maybe 250 or 300 jobs in that two month time span between me graduating and getting the offer or getting the ability to even interview at Braille. But it was because of something I did at the school that made me stick out to the school that made them think Scott Kitselnik when Braille came to them and said, we need a developer. Uh, it happened to be my live project. The live project was the first time while I was at the Tech Academy that I also felt that I was on a team, right? I was part of this two-week sprint that had to make a product work for a client or we were, you know, we were, we were simulating it. And we had our scrum leader and we had our meetings and we had all the things that a real environment would have. And I took it very seriously and I saw a lot of the work that the students were doing and the projects that they did, they worked, right? They intrinsically worked and there was minimums that they, there was minimum requirements and user stories that needed to be met. But I wanted to just completely blow past that, right? I wanted to take a product and in a two week time frame, I wanted to shoot for the stars and do the best that I can. Uh, with the C sharp project, we were working on an actual client's website so on that project, I focused more on the technical ability of the app. But on my Python project, I was able to create a, a product from scratch in two weeks. And I, and I took that thing like to the moon, right? So I just, I completely built it from the ground up. I made it look the best that I can, applied the best styling that I knew. Um, and I'm not a UX or a UI designer. So I inevitably need to look these things up and, you know, try to replicate these things. But I was very proud of what I created. I felt that, you know, it could be a website 
and, and a product people could use. Um, and to this day, it's still running on a digital ocean server, you know, it's, and, and it does have users. I, I created a, a video game database. So what it does is it allows you to search for any video game. Uh, and it uses the, it uses a library that has over 450,000 titles. So you'd be very hard pressed not to find a game on there. And it allows you to store these games and it allows you to create an account and do password reset and uh, update your account and all of these things that sound basic but are actually very hard you know for someone who hasn't built this in the past and i learned a lot during that live project and i think the school really liked how it came out they um uh they featured it in one of their their weekly features and it was something i was very proud of and it was also one of those things that i made sure to put more work in than anyone else i just wasn't go i just I decided that I wanted to win the live project is pretty much what it came down to. I was going to get noticed. Uh, it was an opportunity to get noticed by the school. Uh, I mean, you can get noticed, you know, in your homework if you do something fancy, but the live project was, it was more meaningful. And it led back to getting the offer from Braille. I, I really do believe that uh, because of how well I did with the live project, that allowed me to speak to higher higher ups within the tech academy, introduce myself. They have an awareness of who I am now, and uh, and what I'm capable of creating. Um, and when Braille came to them, I was one of the people that came to their mind. So that that is my example of how to set yourself up for su future success. Uh, I happen to see an opportunity. An opportunity happened to happen at the right time, and I took advantage of it. We don't control the opportunities that come our way, but we control how ready we are for them. So we need to make sure that, you know, we are working as hard as we possibly can, that we are staying healthy, both physically and mentally, taking breaks when we know we need breaks, but also putting in the time and the hours when you know it counts. There are things that just look right and look professional, and then there are things that don't. And unfortunately, the world is a tough place, and it can be very critical of our work, and it's sometimes hard and vulnerable to put your work out there. But I urge you to start somewhere, to create your GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket repos. I urge you to join open community projects. By the way, employers, especially of larger companies, love when you are able to talk about things that you have you know merge actual merge requests that you have given to these open projects you know go to facebook's react project and see if there's something there you could figure out that no one else wants to do it doesn't have to be hard or complex it could be something really silly like they want the you know the welcome screen ui updated or something like that that no one else wants to do but you easily know how to do and you could just put your mark on it or you could, you know, focus on harder things and, and really stretch yourself and learn new things. The important thing is that you're contributing, you're getting your name out there and you're learning the new technologies. You're putting your way in a line of sight of these opportunities. So when they do come, because inevitably, if you're putting yourself out there, they will, you will be, you will be better prepared to not only you know, see them because a lot of people don't even see the opportunity sometimes, but to also answer when it comes calling and, and uh, it gives you a lot more confidence in your day to day life and your work life. And it allows you to be comfortable uh, learning new things and communicating with people. So you have to know what your weaknesses and strengths are, right? And de depending on your, your, your weaknesses, most people will never turn a weakness into a strength. It just, you're intrinsically, you have this weakness for a reason. It's just part of your human nature. But what you can do is you could evolve that strength to overcome your weakness. And you could also mitigate the weaknesses itself, right? So I'm horrible when it comes to styling. I'm really bad at it. Now, I like CSS. I don't mind CSS. But because I knew that I would never be a, U, a good UI designer that I could never stack up to professionals. I didn't, I didn't 
originally learned things like SAS and SCSS, and I didn't um, uh, I didn't clog up my learning capacity with those technologies because I knew that they wouldn't really make a big difference for me. Yes, I was interested in what they were. I wanted to know how to do them. My general curiosity just wanted to know. But instead, I learned things like Xamarin for C Sharp, you know, things that I knew would have a much more direct impact, you know, Kotlin for Java development and React and React Native, which have become huge in the past year. Um, I also knew that I was opening myself up to opportunities because of the trends. You need to be able to follow trends. And the easiest way to follow actual trends is to go on glassdoor.com or dice.com and look at these job requirements. And a lot of it you could almost ignore because, you know, <clears throat> junior position looking for five years experience you're going to see things like this all the time but what you will notice if you read enough of them are the trends react developer react developer react react native react developer react developer no javascript react developer these things will start to stick out and you'll be able to know what you should focus on if that's something that you are interested in focusing on it depends what type of job you're looking at it might be a c-sharp job right Right now, the buzz is knowing .NET Core. So we're, um, we're coming out of the, I believe we're on .NET 5 right now, and we're about to go into .NET Core. And uh, for .NET Framework, it's being retired. So depending on the company, you are going to either know how to use Framework, and a company is going to continue to use Framework for a long time, or the company is going to be a .NET Core and looking towards the future. You know, I would say less companies are saying, hey, I'm on framework, I wanna move my entire source code over to core. That would be a little bit more of a specialized thing. You're usually gonna see one or the other. So while it feels like you should learn both, I would actually urge you not to. I would urge you to focus on one, to build your mastery on one. You know, you want to practice C-sharp as a language and the syntax of the language itself. But as far as the framework goes, I would put more time and effort into really learning one, applying to jobs that require that one, in streamlining your approach. Um, when an employer looks at you, they say, what type of person is Scott, right? What kind of developer is Scott? And the problem is if you put a whole buffet of things on your resume, they have no clue what type of person you are because you're everything. You're, you're nothing of everything and a little bit of nothing, so to speak, right? So you need to be able to focus and sell yourself as a type of developer or as a type of designer. Someone that specializes in something, someone that could add value to a certain area of their business. And you know, once you're at a company, you can make a name for yourself. At that point, if you wanted to learn another technology, you always could. When a company hires you, they're taking a risk, right? They're they're putting time and energy, and they might not expect a they might not expect a return on their investment immediately. I mean, some might, but most don't. Most know that they're hiring a junior developer, and they're willing to let you learn and make mistakes. But what they're looking for in the interview process is what type of person you are, you know, how you think, which is why algorithms have become such a big part of the interview process, because algorithms, algorithms kind of will show how you break a problem down. Um, and it will, because intrinsically, if you if you want to know what type of thinker you are, if you're visual or audio, audio, you know, an oral thinker or kinesthetic approach an algorithm that you haven't studied for just on your own and just try to figure it out. Spend an hour and just try to figure it out. And you will either you will either find that you're talking to yourself or you're writing everything down or you're jumping back and forth, you know, on a piece of paper or between the book and between and it will tell you if you're an auditory learner or a visual learner. Uh, did you need to look up graphs on Google to understand something? Did you need to see someone else actually write it on the whiteboard for it to click? Were you talking to yourself and you said the same sentence five times, but on the fifth time it made sense? 
it'll tell you what type of thinker you are and it'll better prepare you to go into these interviews. It'll better prepare you to communicate and it'll also better prepare you for, 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 your, for your future career. To build a network of people around you, it's so important. You need to make sure that you're comfortable communicating and the best way to do that is to be comfortable with yourself, to know who you want to be and what you're capable of and where your strengths lie uh, will really allow you to sell yourself as a developer. And um, while we intrinsically just want to know a little bit about everything, what an employer really wants is to know that we know a lot about one thing. And, and, and that's ultimately how you're going to get to to landing a job and, and setting yourself up for future success. Remember, you could always learn new things. You could always, um, you could always explore and, and, and practice and get better and better at things. But uh, at this point in your career, as you're coming out of a boot camp where you're thrown things left and right and up and down, you need to kind of make way of it and filter out what makes the most sense to you and what you feel gives you the most value add to a company. Uh, also something that you're going to be happy with, you know, no one gets into this field if they're not happy doing it. It's hard enough. It's hard enough of a field and a, and a big enough of a challenge, uh, let alone um, if it was something that you weren't happy doing day in, day out, right? No one becomes a mathematician that, that hates math. Well, it, it's the same thing. It's the same thing for us, right? If you don't like challenges, you, you won't like being a software developer. Otherwise, you'll absolutely fall in love with it, kind of like I did. And it'll be something that you're happy with doing the rest of your life. Thankfully, there is new stuff to learn all the time. Uh, and that is also something that we do have. You know, We do have time to learn these new technologies and all of these facets, uh, facets of of new new ways of doing things. Uh, once we are able to show our value add, you have to be able to show that first. It might not be with the employer. It might be with the school. It might be with a friend or a meetup group. You just you just have to start to get out there and let people know that I am serious. I am going to be the best choice if a job offer comes across your lap. Think of me if nothing else and uh, give me the opportunity to show you what I really have. Now you think that the goal is to make the other person think that, you know, and if you have a lot of courage, go out on LinkedIn and reach out to people at other companies. You know, um, I remember reaching out to Devin Weber, who was the CEO of Braille and introducing myself and telling her that I was, you know, super excited. And this is before I even had my first interview. I think Forrest had just mentioned to me, but uh, I was super excited to have this opportunity and, you know, I couldn't wait to fix their problem with their app and uh, that they were making the right choice and instilling in confidence. Uh, you want to make sure you don't cross the line and become a little arrogant or, or thick headed, of course, but you want to make sure that you show them how serious you are as a developer and uh, how this is your career. You know, it's, this is not something we're doing as a hobby at this point. I mean, if it is, you know, this is a, you've come to a really dedicated spot in your hobby, but most of us, most of us, this is our career. This is what we want to do. And, and uh, we're all very serious about making it work. So I would say invest in yourself, streamline your learning, make sure that other people know what your value add is. And, uh, and and you will you will get noticed and you will set your up set yourself up for that future success. So I'm gonna leave the floor open to anybody that has any questions for me, whether it's technical questions about the job or anything I did at school or in general. Um, uh, Kenzie, Rick, I'm not sure if there's anything else you would like from me, but I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there. Yeah, so we did actually have someone ask in the chat. I think they're referring to your live project, but they asked what the name of the video game website was. Uh, so the actual website, uh, the website's there. It lost its uh, HTTPS, so you have to click the little, this is not a safe website link. I have to renew the HTTPS on it. 
It's devsmkapp.com. So D E V S M K A P P dot com. That's another thing. I had no clue what networking was. So I went on, I like purchased a Microsoft business plan and I purchased a domain and I connected the app through, a, you know, I did all this stuff on networking um, because I knew that I would have to like talk about a, a back end and kind of diversify myself. I couldn't call myself a full stack developer if all I had were front end projects. So I knew I needed to get my hands dirty in Nginx and Unicorn and all of these things that are on the back end that are just, we just haven't seen before. Um, so that was a big part of it. Are you able to go to it? Uh, are you able to go to the site, Kenzie? Does it give let you me little... see. I typed it in the chat, but let me check it. Um, Does it give you the little, uh, I don't Ricardo want to... says yeah. it works. It, co it comes right up. Oh, it, oh, maybe, maybe my cert auto renewed. That'd be great. So, so I was really proud of that design. I mean, it was my first project I ever put out to the world, so to speak. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that I was not going to put out the standard, you know, border or div or forget to do my border radius. And, you know, I'm not very good with, with style, but I am able to tell what looks like it would be on a production website and what doesn't, you know, and you could, you could, steal it's okay to steal ideas and styles from other websites so i urge you when you do make your projects you don't have to reinvent the wheel you can make things look really awesome just by going to professional production websites uh i have i, I go on pinterest and i signed up you know i made all of my categories web design you know web frameworks algorithm this that and so i just get sent a bunch of pictures of really awesome looking websites so if i ever need to make a website I have these folders in my Pinterest account where I can reference and give me really good templates to use. So, so that's awesome. the actual Yeah, website. it looks really nice, for, especially for someone so, that says they're not very good at design. Well, I, I, it was a big challenge because I went with a black background, and that's really hard. Um, but a black background tends to hide a lot of your styling errors. Now there's still there still are a lot of styling errors. There's some Quick things tip. that don't fit right, but 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 uh, I'm still proud of it for where I was in the boot camp. Sorry, Rick. What's up? Uh, I just said quick tip with your saying making make it black. Um, the website looks really good. Uh, it is secure, and um, I, I that was a great live project. I think it's awesome. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. It was it was like the first. So there was a lot of opportunities while I was at school to kind of like, hey, I'm Scott. Um, this is who I am. You know, this is what I'm good at. You know, and you can go above and beyond in the homework assignments. But to have a huge impact, most people want to see what you can build, right? They want to see that you could take something from nothing and make it run and have it be stable. And the live project was that first opportunity for me. So I decided not only to make it work, but I also decided to spruce it up and make it stand out. Um, Ricardo asked, during your job search, did you put a lot of your personal projects on your resume? I put three. I only put three because I kept, so I had, I had built two resumes. I had built a two pages, long winded, everything I wanted to put on the resume. And I really made the style, you know, really nice. And I had made a one page minimal styling and I gave, the respective resume to the certain type of job that I knew it was right. So <clears throat> if they were looking for more of a senior role, if it was more of a, if it was a sophomore company, if it was a technology company, they only got the one page resume hands down. If it was anything else, if it was not a technology company, maybe an air conditioning company looking for a developer or, you know, just some other industry, right. Um, I gave them the nicer looking resume. Most technology companies have a very, um, a very streamlined process with the resumes. They prefer, I feel like I've heard that they prefer one page resumes because they get so many, uh, as opposed to an outside company that might not have that requirement or expectation. I was more comfortable sending the nicer styled resume. Now I had put three projects on there. I had put uh, the C-sharp live project I had put this project, so this Python project, 
and I, <clears throat> I milked it a little bit. I split setting up the server for this project as my backend project. Um, those were the three I was most fond of. I had other projects. I did set up another server, but it didn't lead to any sort of production site. So I wanted to make sure that all three of my projects were linked to actual sites out on the web where the person that looked at it could go. So I felt that was very important. Um, thanks so much for that. Um, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned open source projects and contributions, and I was curious where you um, where you would look to find those kinds of open source projects. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, obviously GitHub and GitLab has, I mean, just you know, hundreds of thousands of opportunities out there. You could spend hours just looking up and down. A lot of libraries um, and dependencies will actually tell you what they need help with and it will allow you to either do something technical or or stylistic depending on what you're more comfortable doing um you know if you take on a, a, an open source project you don't necessarily have to f figure it out it's just it's a challenge right it's it's not like a school requirement or a test or anything like that it's more or less just you trying your best to help and if you're able to click and you're able to figure it out and submit, you know, a working merge request, well, that's just another thing that you can put on your resume that shows a bunch, that shows that you have the wherewithal to fix a problem, that you have the outgoing nature to go out there, find a problem that someone's having and be their answer. You're showing that value add and you know how to use Git, which is also very important for a lot of developer and software groups. So I would stick to those two main sites as your main source. You can possibly find specific websites out there, but um, if you GitHub and GitLab have gotten so big, they've almost become like Google for open source projects. So, uh, Mario asked if you also worked on Braille's mobile app. I do everything for Braille that you see technically. So I work on their mobile app. I built their store. They're online at brailleskateboarding.com. Uh, that's a, uh, that's not a React site. That's a Shopify site. Uh, Shopify uses a Python backend. Um, so what you do is you choose a template. I mean, you could build your own template if you want, but that's nuts because Shopify allows so many different integrations. So uh, <clears throat> you choose a template and then you could go into the source code for that template and it looks just like, we learned in school, you have your, your model view controller, you have your, your, your template, your template, uh, HTML and template pages, you have your extends, you have all of your template tags and, uh, you know, all of your conditional template blocks and everything, you know, you might have to, uh, you might have to, you know, go back and go over the Django framework again, but it's, it's all there and, uh, it all makes sense. You could, really make it do whatever you want. It depends how far you want to take the language. Um, so I built that website. I built the mobile app using React Native for both iOS and Android. I built the website called braillearmy.com, which is the web version of the app. So right, we have the web store, which is really just an e-commerce store. But then a lot of people before I came on were complaining, I don't have a device that could handle the app. It's a really old device or I really want a web version because the app crashes and all this stuff. So uh, we came on, we updated the app to make sure it got approved through the app store. We built the website and now I'm in the process of going back and I'm actually transitioning all of the React and React Native <laughs> over to TypeScript, which is a type safe language, which will greatly reduce the number of bugs and crashes and things. Uh, I think the idea behind initial, the initial app was just to get it off the ground. But now that we have over 150,000 users, it's, it's starting to chug and it, it needs some type safety and it needs some type checking. And <clears throat> I couldn't convince them to switch it to Zamarian and C sharp because that would take too long. But at least for the time being, I could, I could incorporate a type safe language with TypeScript. So that's what I'm currently working on now. Uh, Ricardo asked, what programming language do you primarily use during a normal work week? 
Uh, JavaScript and TypeScript. Um, I, we use GraphQL for the API. Uh, Node, which is just JavaScript. It's it's a it's a server framework for JavaScript. Um, and there's this really weird language I use. So our backend is all Google Cloud. We you know you have OWASP, you have Azure, and you have Google Cloud uh, as the three main ones. So the developer set it up with a Google Cloud backend, and Google Cloud has its own language called GQL, um, which isn't GraphQL. It's a Google Query language, oh, Google so, Cloud language. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It, yeah, uh, it's it's a it's a flavor of SQL. It's very similar, um, but it's Google Cloud language. Uh, it's kind of a mix. It's like if Python and SQL met. It's like if SQL made more sense or was more readable. Uh, so I use that a lot for indexing my query. So a query is essentially anytime the client requests data from the server, and what you have to do is you have to set up and index all of your properties. So in school, we learned about relational databases, right? So you create these join tables these ahead of time so that when your website wants to pull a certain piece of data that has to do with two entities or models, you're able to get it. No problem. The table exists. You know, you have a book and an author and a book, and you create a book author table where all authors and books are matched. Well, Google doesn't have well they might they might have a relational database but he didn't set it up that way so it was a little hard he set up something called a document based database which is like mongoose or uh mongoose is the framework uh mongodb so basically what you have is you have just a database with a hundred thousand records and you have to create your own filters and indexes programmatically so with a relational database, most of the time you create that through physical tables in your database. With, with Google, you just pull out all the raw data into your server. You write some really clever code on your server that looks at this table and looks at this table and spits out an answer back to the client in a formatted filter and a formatted query. Um, so that, that's using a language called GQL. That's how I go from the cloud to the server. And then the server, of course, is using Node, which is a Java framework, a JavaScript framework that goes down to that. Goes down to that. I actually don't write, uh, and I also do a little CSS and SAS uh, for the websites. I write almost no HTML because I'm using React. React generates all the HTML for you. So, I mean, that's the whole point. React uses something called JSX, which is HTML inside of JavaScript or JavaScript inside of HTML, however you decide to look at it. And it spits out all of that HTML for you. It's, uh, we're actually, we took it one step further. We're using a framework called Next.js, which is a, it's, it's, it's considered a server side framework for React. So React is a framework for JavaScript Next is a framework for React. Uh, so I'm talking about frameworks on frameworks here. What it does is it's basically React, but it does all of our rendering on the server versus the client. That gives every client the same experience. So if you're using a 1998 computer or a 2021 computer, your client, you know, the, the server, re the response from the server will be the same. As far as like how fast a picture loads, that's that will depend on how much memory you have, how fast your SSD might be. But the the server response is all the same because of this framework that we're using called Next.js. It's a great talk, Scott. Thanks for coming out. Um, now I think you could be a teacher as well. You're you're really good at presenting what you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I. I really want to spread the knowledge. I really believe that anybody that goes through the Tech Academy boot camp, if you made it through the boot camp, if you're able to coerce with, you know, your teachers and your instructors and your peers, I wholeheartedly believe that we all have what it takes to work at Google, work at Facebook, work wherever we want. Those developers are no better than us. They really aren't. They just saw the opportunities at the right time or they took a different path that led them down a different route. So, uh, you know, I want to spread as much knowledge as I can here, Rick, and try to encourage people 
to be the best that they can. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, can you talk a little bit about mentors? Um, who how, how to find mentors and uh, that type of there, thing? Sure, there's a couple websites out there where you could find mentors. Um, uh, a lot of those are paid for mentor sites, and I don't know. There was just something about that that I personally didn't love. I didn't want to pay for a mentor. I, I felt like I wanted to find a mentor, and a mentor wanted to mentor me, you know, as an apprentice. Uh, I kind of, I kind of fell into a tough spot because I. This is my my first job as a software developer in charge of, you know, all the things I'm in charge of. And while I did have the ear of a senior developer in the freelancer that was there for a couple months, he was gone after two months. So I personally don't actually have a mentor. And I so wish that, you know, every time, you know, this opportunity is so great and I wouldn't train it for the trade it for the world. But, you know, that's the one thing that this opportunity didn't have was a mentor. I had to continue to figure everything out on my own. I didn't want to pay for a mentor. And, and um, I would say if you're able to find a mentor through your meetups or through friends, or if you're lucky enough to know a senior developer personally, don't be afraid to ask them for mentorship. You know, you can go about it through a normal relationship and just slowly build up asking questions. But I would say absolutely take advantage of it if you have that opportunity. Rick, I have a hard time talking about it because I didn't. But I would tell you that if you do, without a doubt, it's completely worth it. Yeah. Mentors are uh, good to have, but you were dedicated and just kind of found your own way. I Yeah, well, I continue to. I would also, uh, if you're having a hard time finding mentors, consult with your job placement director. Talk to the school. There might be alumni out there that might be willing to mentor as well. Uh, so, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of different avenues. Now that you have gone through the school, you have this huge reference. I mean, every day we talk about where do I go from here? Job placement so hard. What do I do next? But a lot of people don't realize that we have the weight of the school behind us. You know, we have all these people looking out for e each other. We have available uh, mentors available and alumni that we can reach out to and uh, job opportunities that might be there. You know, we just have to be comfortable speaking up or, you know, making it known that you want these things. A lot of people assume that people know what they want, but people really don't. Or there's so many people that want the same thing. The only ones that really get it are the ones that ask for it. So you have to be willing to do that as well. So thank you very much, Mario. Mentors.codingcoach.io. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like the culture of like mentorship in general has deteriorated somewhat in the last like couple generations. I just feel like it it's not something that happens as automatically as it used to. Which is why it's even more um, sacred, right? You have to, you know, if you do get a good mentor, you know, make sure that it's a healthy relationship and, you know, you, you're, you're making sure that they know how grateful you really are for it, so. And also like, um, you know, not the same, necessarily the same type of relationship, but um, Career Karma has been really stepping up their game with their app. So if you download the yeah. Career Karma app, they'll like text you and they kind of have designated career coaches that will reach out to you too. So that's another cool resource uh, that people might want to look into. Um, career Karma is, it, like you said, they're really stepping it up. Uh, in the past six months or so, their app has come full circle. They completely redid the app and there are a lot of people on there that are very willing to help other people. Um, I would definitely, you know, attend some of their, they have, they kind of have this, but in an auditory form where you could ask to go and speak and give your two cents. Um, and a lot of people there, especially the founders, the founders go in on a lot of the calls uh, and they're very willing to say, Oh, uh, uh, you did this. So uh, why don't you hook up with, you know, X, Y, Z over here and see if you can get something going or, you know, they're very, very willing to help people. So. Yeah. And thanks again for, um, for hopping in that Q and a room too. Those have been really cool and we appreciate you doing that and doing this and um, sure. all that you've given back to the tech Academy. Of course. I mean, the tech Academy, you know, I, 
I owe them. I'm indebted. You know, this, uh, it's you know what gave me the opportunity, and um, and I'm very grateful. So I appreciate it, and I had it, and I had a good time. It's always fun to come back uh, and course with you guys. So yeah, thanks for coming out, Scott. Uh, do you have a question for you? Said you're a Giants fan. I'm a huge Giants fan. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about uh, what you think of the uh, draft of Daniel Jones. <laughs> I'm actually <laughs> could be controversial, so you don't have to talk about it. I'm I actually said no, it's okay. It's all right. I'm actually okay with it. I believe that this year is his year to uh, either make it or kick the bucket. I think you know you come to New York and you're either in it or you're out, right? Like we're not we're not going to put up with it for too long. So he's been getting better and better each year, but he needs to really shine this year. He's going to have Barkley back. He's going to have a lot of the receivers around him. So he's going to need to really show us that he is able to be a star quarterback in New York City. Otherwise, <clears throat> it's not going to last long. He's going to be on, on the hot seat. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. I understand. I, I think he'll be able to do it, but we'll see. So, thank you very much, guys. I, I greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Does anyone have any other questions? Doesn't right. seem to be. Yeah, well, great if, talk, Scott. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. And if anything comes up in regards to Braille, finally backfilling a position that we need to, you know that I'm going to come straight to you guys first. So, And we so hey, appreciate it. We really appreciate pleasure. this talk. It's been great. Um, thanks so much to everyone that joined us um, from our Tech Academy students and from outside the Tech Academy. We appreciate you being here. And Scott, I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name at the beginning. It's that's okay. Yes, yeah? it, it, that's okay. Yes. Yes, it's um it's Kitselnik, yes. But well, I'll make sure to get it right from now on. That's okay. It's like Kitselnik is just like saying it a little slower, you know. Katselnik is like saying Kitselnik slower. It's fine. Yeah, it's like a different emphasis on the wrong syllable. That's okay. It's only ten letters. I give you I give you, <laughs> you over. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thanks to everyone's here. Um, I'll put my email in here in case uh, anyone, you know, wants to, you know, has any questions that weren't covered and I can relay them to Scott. And um, next week we'll have Devin Weber also from Braille Skateboarding. She's the CEO and she's going to be talking about um, taxes, changes with the CARE Act and how that can affect um, how you work as a developer, whether you're an independent contractor or um employed full-time and we'd love to have you there for that and thank you and goodbye everyone take care thanks again thanks scott thanks all all right another tech